This is uh, my dear friend, tennis partner, co-author, a variety of other things, Larry Kavikov. Uh, and I thought, instead of me always asking the questions, I would start out tonight by handing it over to Larry um, and have him ask me questions, since we are the co-authors of uh, this book, Get What's Yours, Secrets to Maxing Out Your Social Security. And then we're not going to try to talk for very long because one of the points of the, of the book, I mean, the main point of the book was to be useful to people like yourselves who have specific questions about Social Security. I guarantee you that there's nobody in the country who knows the answers to those kind of questions any better than Larry does. Uh, maybe there are a handful. Well, Jerry Lutz, our, our Social Security expert who read the book for accuracy, is a is in your, your league, you may even know a little more than you do, but there's, there's a handful of people in the entire country. So, Larry, I hand it over to you, and you can start. You can be the interrogator. Okay. Thank you, uh, Paul. It's a great pleasure to be here at Gateway College, um, uh, and um, happy to, to, uh, to be with Paul. He's a good buddy, and uh, that's been all easy on the tennis court. So let me start by asking you, Paul. And one, one more thing. This is Yale and Gate. And this is not cheating, because Larry teaches at Boston University and has for many years. But he taught here at Yale. That was your first university. Uh, second. Second. Okay. They, they fired me. Clear. <laughs> um, but you went to the Council of Economic Advisors. Well, no, I'm going to. I went there and then I came back and they fired me. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so both. <laughs> so, <laughs> that makes me like yeah. But, um, oh, let, let me ask you this question to get us going. How, how is it that you came to be my co author? And how, oh, I, I thought I asked how much fun it was. <laughs> but, how, no, yeah, why don't you relate the story about how we came to write the book? So, uh, it was a little more than four years ago, we were playing tennis. When I say playing tennis, one air quotes around the word playing, and possibly around tennis also. <laughs> um, we just hit the ball back and forth and went through scoring. And um, Larry likes to punctuate these uh, games, if you will, by uh, interrupting with ideas he has. Come here, I want to ask him. So, in one of these interruptions, one of these junctures, Larry says, uh, what are you and your wife Jan, what, what are you doing about Social Security? Now, this is how many years ago? Uh, four or five. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, a little more than four years ago. Um, yeah, four and a half years ago, something like that. And I, being a, a, a know it all, a self styled know it all, that should be in quotes also, a know it all. Uh, I say, don't worry, we've got it all figured out. No problem. Uh, Jan and I are both waiting until 70. Because we know. We're cognoscentic. We're in the know. And we know that if you wait till 70, you get the maximum possible benefit. We didn't know how much more, to be honest with you, but we've got no Social Security um, statements, uh, statements year after year, and I've read them diligently. And it said if you wait until 70, you get a lot more than if you wait until 66. And I thought, Hmm, let's see, how long am I likely to live? Well, if I live until 83, that would be the break even. And my father lived to 99, and my mother till 90. So I figured to live to more than 83, and after that point, I will be collecting more in benefits than I would have left on the table waiting from age 66 to age 70. Well, because you get a higher benefit if you start later. So the benefit is 76% higher if you start taking it at 70 versus 62. Let's let's let's, 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 let's not do numbers yet. Uh, the my main job at the book was to rein Larry in, and that will be my job even when I, as he asks me questions. <laughs> um, and so I said, we're waiting till 70. We've got it all figured out. And he said, you said. Um, I said, how old are you and Jan? 
And I said, well, we're, we're 66, well, we're just about no, to be 66. No, no, you said, I got it figured out, don't ask. I had to ask question like five times. No. And he was getting angry. And he finally... Now you can imagine what co-authorship is like. He was getting, <laughs> beginning to get a little sense of it. It wasn't five times, it was two times. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it was really tough pulling this information. All I was asking is, is they, so, so he tells me, he, I guess Jan's a little bit older, maybe six months older, than a year old. You're older, so Paul is 65, Jan 66, and uh, he tells me this finally, and I said, okay, uh, I'm going to make you $50,000 in the next two minutes, and you're going to take me to dinner. Deal? And you said, yeah, sure. But I mean, it was <laughs> that kind of, yeah, sure. It was like, is he, he, if you think I'm a know-it-all, I'm not even in his league. Although I know he knows a great deal, you understand. I'm just, it, but I figured, I got this figured out, and I, oh, he's off on a he's high horse again, and so forth. And I said, sure, sure, I'll take you to dinner. I think I said, anywhere in the world, $50,000. And I thought it was preposterous. Uh, the little glimmering of skepticism about my own position, I guess, mind you, because it seems so, such an audacious statement. You know, $50,000, I mean, he's going to really have egg on his face when it turns out he's, he's all wet. So maybe, maybe there's something. And then you explained to me, because he had asked, do I think we're taking spousal benefits? And I said, no, spousal benefits, that can't be for us. And then you explained. So what did you explain? So there's a way that you can get, in effect, a free spousal benefit if you're patient. And uh, the way it works is that one spouse has to file for a their retirement benefit, but they can suspend its collection. And you, can, you have to wait to be over full retirement age, which in their case was 66. So what we ended up suggesting, what I ended up suggesting to Paul and Jan do is have Jan file for her benefit and suspend its collection. Just saying, I don't, I don't want, I'm just not taking it down. I'm in the system. I'm. So Jan would still wait till 70 to collect her highest possible benefit. And then Paul, when he reached 66, which was a year later, would file just for a spouse benefit. And he'd be able to get that uh, spouse benefit, which equal, equals half of uh, Jan's full retirement benefit. And he'd be able to get that for four years. And that was about 12500 bucks a year, times four years is $50,000. And then at 70, Paul could then file for his own retirement benefit. Now, it was actually a way to make both of you I'm going to tell you this at the time, I wanted you to go this direction because uh, you could have actually both gotten the $50,000 for free had you divorced. Because <laughs> <laughs> divorces have an advantage. Uh, you can get divorced, you have to be divorced for two years before you can pull this off. And uh, then you can each file on the other person's work record. And so Street presumes that the other person has filed or pretends the other person has filed to let you file on their work record, even if they haven't filed. Kind of like a virtual filing. So we could have actually made you $100,000, but I, you know, caring a lot about uh, you and realizing that once free of you, Jan might not want to remarry you after the city <laughs> said, I decided not to tell you that part. I I, I'm sitting here going, now you tell me this? <laughs> no, I was, we were not about to engage in that. But uh, so Security has these crazy incentives to get married, to get divorced, to live in sin, uh, to get remarried. We'll get into that. So, everybody follow what I wound up doing here? In other words, Jen, 66, 67 at the point I turned 66. She's waiting till 70. She simply calls up Social Security, makes an appointment. She didn't even have to go anywhere. It was all done on the phone. The, uh, she said the only thing that upset her about the conversation, everything was fine, they were lovely to her, but she objected to the question, are you a nun? <laughs> that was, I don't know why they asked it. Why did they ask it? Uh, I don't think it's standard. I think she, maybe it's just sounded very saintly or something. <laughs> <laughs> that could have been it. In any case, so she files, she, in other words, registers for the Social Security system, that's all. He's in the system, 
And now she says, I'm not taking any money. Eh, I don't want to take the benefit. Oh, actually, there are provisions for clergy. i got to be, i got to recall those, but go ahead. Okay, so there might, it's it might, it was, yeah, so there was some um, angle there. Yeah. Uh, so she registers, files, that is, she suspends, she's still waiting for 70, just what we were going to do in the beginning, right? I hit 66, I call them on the phone, they couldn't have been nicer, they didn't ask me if I was a nun, uh, and they said, Sir, wait just a second. I have to check as to whether or not you can do this. So this is now, you know, the actual official Social Security person that I made an appointment with, to be on the phone with. And she came, she checked with the supervisor, came back online, said, thank you, sir. She couldn't have been nicer. Said, thank you, sir. I, I really appreciate this. I didn't know you could do that. But I will tell everybody who calls from now on because we're committed to giving you the highest possible benefits, the benefits which you've paid for and to which you're entitled. Um, and I think it was about, it wasn't quite 50,000, I think it was about 11,000 something per, per year. We added up to 45, 46,000, I never actually calculated exactly. But it, it just came and they, they deposited in your bank account. I mean, you tell, tell them it's an automatic deposit. Uh, you only pay taxes on 85% of it at most, of those, of those benefits. Uh, we'll get into whether that's fair or not, but that's the way it works. And suddenly there was this income stream. For me, it was pure gravy. But for, for me and my wife, but for most Americans, this is a way to subsidize help pay for your living expenses while you wait until 70. This is an inducement. This is a reason to wait until 70 because you, if you're married or were married for 10 years, right? Then you will get, you can get this benefit, half of the benefit that the spouse gets at age 66, right? That's what's called the full retirement benefit. The maximum is if you wait all the way until 70. But the full retirement benefit is on which this number is based. You get 50% of it as the spouse. That's the spousal benefit. And it allows you to wait. Now, what? just the guess. And then I'll turn it back to Larry here. How many people think, I'll give you just a few choices. How many people think that 20% uh, or more of Americans wait until 70 before collecting Social Security? 20% or more. Hands up. Uh, one, two, three, the book. How many, uh, four, five, so half a dozen. How many people think 10% or more of all Americans uh, wait until age 70? Uh, that's now twice as many, so that's another couple of dozen. Uh, a dozen or so, a little more. How many people think it's at least 5% of all Americans? This is at least 5%. You can raise your hand if you... All right, so that's half the... How many people think it's at least 3% of Americans waste until... Your hands got to go up here, so I have some sense of... You can't all sit there. At least 5% means 5% or more. 5% or more of Americans, right. Wait until... Yeah, five, at least 5% of all Americans wait until age 7. Now I'm saying at least 3%. The answer is less than 2%. Less than 2% of all Americans wait until 70. Now, we understand completely that there are people who cannot afford to wait. We under... So, fine. If you can't afford to wait, you can't afford to wait. And that's why I make the point the spousal benefits can be so tremendously useful in enabling you to wait, right? But it cannot be, I'll throw it back to you, it cannot be, can it? Less than 2% of Americans are, can afford to wait and everybody else? Yeah, well, that, that is the, it is the fact, and there are data from Social Security that, that document this. But uh, the reason that people seem to be taking the benefits early is that they worry about dying without collecting them. And that was the uh, that was the same calculation I was making. How long will I live? What's the break even going? Yeah, so. Uh, so I want to talk to you uh, for a few minutes just about how to think about uh, 
collecting benefits and the issue of longevity. Um, it took a little while for me to persuade my co-authors uh, to think about this the way economists think about it. So most can everybody hear him in back there? <laughs> so, kind of pull that up close. Okay. Is that better? <laughs> no, it's still me. And that's better. Okay, hold it. Bend it down. Bend it. No, bend it up towards your mouth. Bend it. Okay. He's an economist. He doesn't understand. <laughs> there we go. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So uh, most people are very fixated on dying, right? This is our biggest worry. We're going to die. But and that seems to be the biggest risk in life, which is dying. But if you think about it, if you die, where do you get to go? You get to go to heaven. And in heaven, you don't need much money. As a matter of fact, I don't think you need any money. I think everything's free. Or you get as much money as, as you want. You can, whatever denomination, currency, uh, and gold bars, if you like. So the real danger of uh, living is not dying. It's really living. It's living to a ripe old age like 100, and many, many people now are living to a very old age, and really outliving your money, that's the real danger. And Social Security is providing this uh, unique insurance, which is a payment that continues until you die. So if you live to 100, it will, every year you'll be getting that, that payment. Now imagine... And it's inflation adjusted. And it's inflation adjusted, and it's, uh, it's hard to believe that Anybody's really going to cut those benefits once they start coming in because there's uh, an organization called the American Association of Retired People. It's an ARP. They have something like 50 million members. And if anybody, anybody proposed cutting the benefits of existing beneficiaries, they would be, you know, I think they would be possibly torn to shreds and politician well, by people in their 80s or 90s. It's just not conceivable. We would default on the U.S. government debt uh, before we actually cut any, any anybody's benefits. My mom's 95 right now. Cutting her monthly check, that's just not going to happen. So this is very safe politically, uh, economically against inflation. And it's really insurance against living to a very old age. So we have to think about it as an insurance policy. Now, by analogy, so a lot of people think about it as break even. On you know how if I give up these low lower level benefits for let's say eight years between 62 and 70, uh, I'm going to get this higher stream, but I might not make it. So how many years will it take me to kind of catch up? And that was the calculator I had. That's what Paul was thinking, and that's not really the right way to think about it because Paul only has one life to lose. He's not going to die many many times, so he can't treat himself or think about himself as uh, as an insurance company where he's got many lives to, to die. Uh, and, you know, it's not Groundhog Day, that movie where <laughs> Bill Murray kept dying over and over again. Uh, I never saw the movie, but I think that's what the theme. You have to work, look at really the worst case scenario, just like when it comes to buying homeowner's insurance. We don't think about that on a break-even basis. We don't say, well, gee, I've got this uh, $200,000 house. And the probability that it burns down is very small, so I'll take the probability of it burning down a very small number times the $200,000. That's the expected return on this investment, and I'll compare that with an insurance premium for buying a homeowner's policy. If we did that, we would never buy homeowner's policy. A uh, homeowner's policy. Uh, we don't do that because we only have one house to pull over, so we can't take the probability, we can't play the averages, which is really using the probabilities, actual calculations. We have to look at the worst case scenario, which is the house burns down. And we buy, no matter really how expensive the homeowner's policy is, we have a home, we buy homeowner's insurance. Here, and, then, and this is true of any insurance, right? Yeah, this is really true of any insurance. Liability insurance, here the worst auto case, insurance. Yeah. And here the worst case scenario, that, you know, you get cancer, health insurance. Auto insurance, we crash the car, total the car. Here the worst case scenario is what? It's not dying tomorrow because we'll be in heaven. It's living to 100. And that's why we have to value the policy's benefits right out through age 100. And so, and economists have developed methods for doing that to go back to the mid-60s. So it's, uh, we know really how to value this as a financial instrument, this insurance. It's not so straightforward with homeowner's insurance or health insurance. But here, because it's a stream of payments, which has some 
similarities to some other streams like a bond stream, it could be priced out. So this is a uh, Social Security is providing this very valuable insurance and it has to be valued the right way out through all the benefits out through 100. The other thing is that when they when they design the what's called actual increase, how much they increase your benefits if you wait to 70 versus taking them earlier, uh, they used uh, a 3% inflation adjusted real rate of return. This is due to. This is well, let me just say, it's a very, even if you were thinking about this on an investment basis, this is building a very high rate of return that you can't get today on the market. Let me just put it that way. Yeah, and, and, and this, the simplest way to think about that without going into the real rate of return is that for every year that I waited between 66 and 70, and I am now 70, and collecting my full benefit, every year that my wife waited, our benefit increased by 8% for each of those years, inflation adjusted. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but getting 8% guaranteed inflation adjusted is, Larry's using a lower number because of the risk, he's working in actuarial. If he, dies, if, he does, if he dies, nobody gets anything, so it's not exactly like a bond. We have to make that distinction, but. Uh, so part of the 8% is compensating him for the possibility that he'll die and he'll get anything. Right. As a, it's, it's an annuity, if you, those of you who know what an annuity is. So you know, your kids don't get the money after you die. So if you take that out, you still have a rate of return that you can't get anywhere else. And that's the beauty of the importance of taking, waiting until 7. And my wife and I could afford to do that, so it wasn't an issue for us. But for, I repeat, for people for whom it is not so obviously affordable, being able to take the spousal benefit affords you the opportunity, the ability to it. So, Paul, let me ask you this question. What would have happened had you taken your retirement benefit at the same time you took your spousal benefit at age, family at age 66? If I'd taken them, if I tried to take them both, I would have gotten the higher of the two. So you would have wiped out your spouse's benefit. Yes, if I if I if I'd taken it at 66, don't they just compare the two? They give me the higher of the two, and then I would never have gotten a spousal benefit at all. Right. So the reason I was asking this question is to point out that and the book details this. Social Security has all these landlines, we call them gotchas, that uh, you can if you know what you're doing, you can make out, get what's yours. If you don't, if you screw things up, you can really get hurt. And then one of the big land landlines, which we talk about a little bit, but we really, I think, the more I'm getting emails from people, uh, the more I think we need to emphasize this, is that Social Security's office itself, the staffers there are a landline. They will potentially tell you absolutely the wrong thing, and they'll do, be, do it in a very adamant way. I got an email today, this is one of like six I've gotten in recent, uh, the last couple of weeks, where you have a, have a staffer who's told somebody who took their retirement benefits early, let's say at 62, they got to full retirement age, what they want to do is suspend their benefits and start them up again at 70 at a 32% higher level. You can do that. So if you start taking your benefits early and you decide that you made the wrong decision, you can at least recoup some of that mistake if you feel that's a mistake by suspending your benefit when you hit full retirement age and starting up against at 70. You can't, you can't, can you suspend before age six? You can't, you can't suspend before full retirement age. You have to wait until full retirement age. So, but right now, full retirement age is 66. So you took, so your, your person took at 62. Then she heard you or me or somebody on the radio. Yeah, and, and she, she went, oh, or she read the book and she went, oh, wait a second, I made a mistake. I buy the argument about insurance. I'm going to wait until 70. Ah, I hit 66, now I'm going to suspend and get that 8% a year increment that I would otherwise have missed, right? Sure, yeah. And, uh, and then the Social Security person on the phone uh, or at the office sometimes, he says, no, you can't do that. Uh, they come up with different, they say it's too late, you could, they do not know the regulations at all. So I have asked them to, these people, uh, actually put me on the phone with the Social Security person to, to merge me in. 
and, and to try and create this. And then, of course, the social security person won't talk to me because whatever, they don't want to be. But they're adamant. It's not, it's just not a, a maybe. You are absolutely dead wrong. You can't do this. Forget about it. When it's actually there in black and white uh, in the regulations now, Social Security has 2,728 rules in its handbook. <laughs> and then it's got something called the Program Operating Manual System, which uh, has uh, perhaps two to 300,000 rules about those 2,728 rules. So, and they're written in a language. These rules about the rules and the rules themselves are written in more or less a foreign language. So you have to be very knowledgeable about what these terms mean. It took, it took me a very long time to figure out how to read this language. And of course, I was always I was fortunate to be able to talk to people at Social Security at their office, the actuary, their headquarters in Baltimore, who are really expert and who would say, oh, this is what this really means. So it took years to really unravel what Social Security's rules were about. And you know, when I learned about free styles of benefits, full styles of benefits that people like, you know, uh, all other people could collect. Then I started writing in my column, I've been writing a Paul had me write a column for his PBS News Hour section of, his web, of the website. Of the, so I answered it's called, it's called Making Sense. And so if you go there and he, he, he answers questions every Monday or today is a social security puzzle, I guess, today. It's yeah. called Ask Larry. And all the people have been writing in for two and a half years with their specific right. questions, which some of you, I assume, and hope will have in just a few minutes. And these people are, are also reading this column for two and a half years, so I get emails from people that say, I've been reading your column every week. It's going on for two and a half years. So they figured out already what they should do for themselves, but they're reading this because it becomes like a Sudoku puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> So today I wrote this column called the Social Security Puzzler, and I put out a, a uh, well, I'll, give you, I'll, give you, I'll tell you, what, uh, tell you the, the case I put out, then I'll turn it back to you all. I'm perhaps talking what I do here to share. But I took the example of a 61-year-old husband, and the wife is 45, and they've just adopted two children. One, one is disabled, uh, age uh, five, the other's age three. And the question is, what should they do? The husband is retired, the wife has stopped working. She actually made more money in her shorter period of time than he did. I asked him, the puzzler, how many cases do you have? This is a very complicated case, it turns out. I asked, in some cases, like Paul's, it was very straightforward. I could answer in two, two seconds, or two minutes, really. I had a friend, Glenn Lowry, who didn't know about widow's benefits. I made him $120,000 in about a minute. He had to pay for dinner, too. Uh, I had a friend, uh, Dana, who's got, to, he got married very late. He has uh, kids under, uh, they're still in high school. I, I made him $15,000. Had I talked to him a couple years ago, I would have made him more like $45,000 on child benefits. Uh, I really regret not having thought about this. Just on the spur of the moment, I said, Dana, what are you doing with Social Security? And how old are you? Same thing. This was just the other night. And uh, he just picked up $15,000. Just like that. The, uh, and he's a painter. He's not, you know, a uh, high, high income earner. So, the, uh, and he made the money. So, in this case of the puzzler, it turns out that uh, I have a, a company where we have a software program called Maximize My Social Security, which for forty dollars can help you figure out exactly what to do. And so I took this hypothetical household and I ran them through our software. It turns out that the software went through thirty-one thousand six hundred and twelve cases. So that was the answer to one of the questions: How many cases do you have to do? How many different collection strategies? Because there are all these months, uh, these different benefits. Uh, I could take, the husband could take his retirement benefits starting the first month when he hit 62, or the next month, or the month after that. You know, all these combinations. And the wife, when is she going to take the benefits? When should we file for the kids' benefits? What month exactly? So, 31,000 cases. You have to figure this out in your brain. This is what we have set up for Social Security for people. Uh, and by the way, I'm not opposed to Social Security. I think it's, it's doing great good. I think it just needs to be fixed fundamentally. So we don't have 
it kind of randomly was redistributing between uh, people that do and don't know me, or do and don't know probably tennis with me or with somebody else who knows about the system. Anyway, so the answer to that one was 31,000 plus question and, uh, cases. The second question I asked is, how many different benefits was this couple going to get through time if they followed the optimal plan? Well, and this was a low-income couple. It wasn't a middle-income couple. It wasn't the husband stopped working earning about $40,000. The wife was earning about $50,000 when she stopped working. They weren't zillionaires or anything. Anyway, I said, uh, how many different benefits should they be taking through time? It turns out to be 10 different benefits. There's child benefits. So one child, for example, a disabled child is going to collect first on the dad. The answer was the dad should collect early, not wait to 70 like Paul did, but start his retirement benefit at 62 so that the kids could start collecting child benefits on his record and the mom could collect what's called a child and care spouse benefit because she's not working and the kids are collecting and, and she's taking, providing care for the kids so she can collect a child and care spouse benefit. Now there's a family benefit maximum so that comes into play here. But anyway, the disabled child first collects on the dad then when the, uh, the mom takes her retirement benefit at 70 the kid starts collecting on the mom's record because this is a higher uh, uh, full retirement benefit when the child gets the end of the full retirement benefit. And then uh, when the dad passed away, since he's older, uh, he's gonna, the child's going to start collecting a, spouse, a survivor, survivor child benefit on the dad's record, even though the dad's got this lower benefit, but it's the child's survivor benefit is 75% of this lower number rather than 50% of a higher number. So it behooves the kid to collect on the, on the dad. And then when the mom dies, the kid starts collecting on the mom's record. Disabled children can collect for their entire lives as long as they were became disabled before age 22. So that's four of the 10 things that they have to do to maximize their benefits. I then asked in this puzzler, how much were the lifetime benefits if they did the optimal thing? It was like something like $1.2 million. And then I asked, how much would they uh, lose in benefits if they, if the mom just took her benefits at 62 and the dad waited until 70 to collect his benefits, what would happen? Well, it turns out they'd lose about almost $100,000. So $100,000 is more than this couple last year earned after tax. It's like a whole year's earnings. So getting this straight, you have to realize this is a completely risk-free thing to do. So why did we write this book? Uh, it's, I, I want to get across that we're not trying to, uh, Social Security's got a lot of funding problems, a lot of structural problems, a lot of inequities, but we felt that people should not benefit from the system if they know the rules and others not. We just felt that's a huge inequity. Uh, there's other inequities that, that we're concerned about, generational inequities, who's going to pay for all these benefits that older people are getting right now and baby boomers will be getting. But uh, but that was our kind of one of my main motivations, I think Paul too, uh, making sure everybody gets what they pay for it and not make it a random outcome. Yeah, I think for me, I'm just reflecting as I'm listening to you and thinking, why did I uh, get enthusiastic about writing the book? And it really was a tussle to get through. Um, the Yes, it was Larry's fault. Um, but I think once he told me uh, what I should be doing, what the optimal strategy was for me, and you, you'll, you've forgotten, but it actually it wasn't quite that simple. Because the question was, do I take on Jan's record, or does she take on my record? I earned more than she did. So, but she only would have a little less than three years. She's, I think, 14 months ago, uh, older than I. She looks about five years younger, but she's... Uh, so she would have only a li little less than three years to collect on mine. I had a full four to collect on hers. So actually, it was a kind of a close call, although I, there was more money in it for me taking from her than the other way around. So even that wasn't completely obvious or straightforward. But I think what happened and I'm really reflecting on this for the first time sitting here with you. I think I felt kind of guilty, actually, in the sense that 
not only would it be unfair that I know you and therefore I get something that other people don't get, uh, but that it's just unfair that I would know anything that other people didn't know would be in the same position I am or are in the same position I am, and they, just out of ignorance, whether they know you, whether they know anybody in this room, whether they read a column or whatever, wouldn't, you know, they would, they would get it, and those of you who, you know, didn't know about any of this until you came here, wouldn't, that, I mean, it's not any really deeply different than what you're saying. I'm just adding the element of guilt to it, because I think that was, in fact, part of what was making me feel like I had an obligation to get this out. I mean, I'm a, I'm a public television uh, reporter uh, for the, with the PBS NewsHour, and have been for 30 years, and my whole job in life is to make economics more accessible to people, make it transparent, make it understandable, because people are so scared of economics. Making sense, like yeah. you're the yeah. title yeah. of your website. Right, and making sense is the title of the pieces I do. And so the whole idea is to try to explain it, um, explain the complexities of economics and make them simple. And it seemed like once I began to discover the complexities of Social Security, it seemed like a natural extension of what I did and that I would be not doing my duty now that I knew that other people didn't and not share. So, yeah, I mean, and you can just see, I mean, as we sit here and talk, he, he's given a particularly difficult case with the kid with the disability and so forth, but Almost every case has complexities of some sort. Just what should we do? When should we do it? How should we do it? Are we making some mistake that's going to result in a gotcha, as he, as he uh, refers to them? And just believe me that every person sitting here now is no different than everyone else in the country except people who have been reading this column or been reading some other expert on Social Security or have made it their business to really master the system as best they can. But as you can see, you know, you have to be age 62 or age 64 and it's only 75% of the benefit. And those are all the 2,000, how many? 2,728 rules. 2,728 rules that are just the basic rules before you get into the interpretations of them. And so that's, that's what... You know, we spent a couple of years, and of course you spent many years with really mastering the system. With regard, the only other thing I wanted to say, and then I think we'll open it up to questions right, right now. But the, the, it is true, although we have no way of knowing how true, or how pervasively true, uh, it's true that the people on Social Security, who work for Social Security, cannot be relied upon. It's not that they aren't the most well-meaning people in the world. They're just like us, right? But if you put yourself in their shoes and you're bombarded with people calling all the time and they're behind and there are budget cuts and there are you know, people coming into the office who have no idea what they're doing, you can understand, I think, fairly simply, fairly easily, how difficult it is and how you don't even have time to master the system, and it's almost impossible to master. This is an economics professor. How many, when did you first start maximizing my social security? So, about four years ago. Five years ago. So, I mean, you know, work, work, and we would, we, I still have to consult the book when I'm, you know, trying to figure out what somebody should do in such and such a circumstance. Uh, and, and Larry is checking with an expert every single week, right? Who sometimes corrects you. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so it's completely understandable why the people in the social security system would be giving you bad advice. It's not that they mean to, it's just that they don't know. Uh, but all the more reason for you to know, because otherwise you're at their mercy. Yeah, I think it's a little, I guess I have a slightly different take. I think the fact that they're so adamant when they're so often so wrong, that, that really bothers me. Uh, well, we, we, we hear the worst cases. We, this is where we, dis, we disagree on what's going to happen to Social Security, and we disagree on the extent to which this system has been rigged as opposed to just uh, morphed or evolved into the complexity uh, that it has. Now we disagree on, on the issue of you know, how helpful or non-helpful are the people in Social Security. I've had personal experience with them, as has my wife. He hears the, the bad cases. The bad cases. And, but the bad cases are not just in the media. There was 
one of our reviews on Amazon in the beginning. Uh, there are hundreds now, or more than hundreds anyway. But one of the very first reviews, we were kind of low in the number of stars because somebody had given us two stars. So I went and said, how dare they give us two stars? You know, this is terrible. Now, let me read. And this was a person, I, I think it's, is it still up there, that review? Yeah, they don't take it out. Yeah, so the, the, you can go and check this for yourself. It, there's a review up there, it says, these guys are wrong. I went to Social Security, <laughs> and they told me that it's not true that you can start taking spousal benefits at age 62. I believe that was the, that, that yeah, email, right? And Larry had, no! <laughs> We're right, they're wrong. And then he did a response to online that we were all egging him on. Larry, you have to do something about this. But there was right, there it is right in black and white or whatever color your computer monitor is. So um, with that, let's, let's have questions coming up. So come right up and right here. And as opposed to any other of these Yale Gateway events, this one is one where people watching will learn as much as you all hear. So the questions are extremely relevant, and please share the first one. Well, first, let me say about you know why some people take social, right there. Take social security out a little bit early. It depends. I have a twin sister, so we can. This is going to make a little sense. I took social security at 65. My total was it was supposed to be at 66. Okay. Now I work in a factory. In order for me to wait until to get it at 70, you know what you're talking about. I would have to spend five years in the factory. Now, my twin sister works in an office. She's got a high-paying job. She's, she can afford to wait until she's 70. And she's not going to be in a factory. A factory, I don't know if any of you other people in here work in a factory, it is a nasty job, whether you like it or not, no matter how great the factory is. And so that's why some of us take in Social Security at an earlier age. We have, you know, we just tired of working. And another thing is, <laughs> I don't care whether you take it at 65 or 70, if you don't have a 401, if you don't have a pension, good luck trying to make ends meet on just Social Security. And my third thing is, my wife passed away five years ago. She collected Social Security for four months and where did all that money that she put into Social Security go? Nowhere. The government's got that. And I don't think that's fair either. So, when did your wife pass away? Five years ago. Six years ago. And how old were you at the time? Uh, we're the same age. So you're now, you started taking your benefits at 65? Yes. First of all, we're sorry about your wife. And, uh, so here's an example. I mean, you could have, did your wife earn as much as you? Or? Oh, no, no, not quite. No, no. And were you well, Did they, anybody tell you about Social Security uh, widower benefits that you could have collected? I, I looked into that, and they said I was making too much money to be able to collect. Yeah, but from age 66, when you, the earnings test, which is another complexity of the system, where they take away benefits if you earn too much money, that stops the day you reach for retirement age, which in your case would have been your 66th birthday. So you had the option, had you known, of collecting a widower benefit between 66 and 70, and they're taking your own benefit at 70, which would have been higher than the benefit you're now getting. Right. So had I you know, interacted with you at the time, I would have said, let's think about going that way. Let's think about tapping into the 401k. Let's think about maybe at least working another couple of years, if you can, because, so, you know, it's, um, life is not perfect, we, we, and uh, things, you know, you're in good health, and you're uh, you're getting. You know, you made a decision, and that's the way it went down. But uh, in retrospect, I think it would have been better to at least have explored taking just a widow benefit. Now, see here again. It's, this is part of the gotchas. If you take, if you were to take both your widow's widow benefit and your own retirement benefit, starting at 66, you know, earnings test, but you would have just gotten the larger of the two, which would have just been your retirement benefit. It would have wiped out your widower benefit. Even, so your wife paid into the system all those years, and part of what she paid it for was to give you really some insurance if she were to pass away, because two can live more cheaply than one, 
And then because they didn't tell you about this, uh, you, you lost out on it. And they don't know, actually, if you have a spouse or if the spouse has died or if you've been divorced or if you had children. They don't have it in the records. You have to tell them about your situation or they won't know. And uh, if you're going along collecting it, you know, maybe you're earning, getting a retirement benefit that's low and your ex dies and he was a higher earner. Well, you can start collecting divorcee widow benefits if you were married for 10 or more years. Now, why do we have a system where... Hey, let's let's leave, leave, yeah. leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that. Thank you very much. There's one thing I want to want to add here. Yeah, come on up. Uh, this earnings test is another one of the great uh, learning moments for me in this book because I had thought, and I think probably at least some of you think, that when they deduct the earnings that you have once you start taking the benefits before age what. Uh, full return. When they start taking away your benefits because you earn too much. Right, if, before, until age 66, right. that that money is simply gone. And the fact is, it's not. They then return that money to you in higher benefits after age 66, right? Yes and no. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, except for certain circumstances, right? Yes, I mean, if I was, for example, taking my return benefit, I lost some of it due to the earnings session, could even lose all of it. They would, when I get to full retirement age, they would kick it back up based on how many months of benefits I lost. But then if, uh, if my spouse died and I flip on to my spouse into a widower benefit, or a widower benefit, which is higher than my retirement benefit, uh, they'll just give me the, the widower benefit, and even though the retirement benefit is higher, I'm not going to get it. Yeah, but that's, so, that, that's a, it's a, for the purposes of just general understanding here, the point is that most people, and I certainly was in this category, thought that when they were taking the money away from you, that was before it. age 66, the money was gone. Earnings test up, you earn too much, it lowers your benefit. In certain circumstances it's true, but for the most part it is not. And if it's just your benefit, why then that money all comes back to you, and it comes back to inflation adjusted in fact. It comes back to you in terms of a higher level of benefits starting for retirement age. Of course, if you die the next day, it won't come back to you in that sense, but, but on an actual real basis, on a, on a, on a playing the averages of what, but anyway, go ahead for your question, sir. I think my question is pretty quick. Um, regarding the divorce situation with the spousal benefits, do I have to contact my ex or? <laughs> Another satisfied customer, ladies and gentlemen. And he's not a ringer. We did not, we did not put him up here. Uh, please come up and, and, and come around. Ten years or more? What's that? Were you married for ten or more years? Twenty-seven miserable years. <laughs> That's more than we want to know, sir. <laughs> All right. So yes, please come up. And people who want to ask questions, come up to the front so that you'll be there. Please go right ahead. I have a different situation. I'm disabled. Look, the, the look to the camera. I'm disabled. And, I'm 51, so and right into the mic, too. I'm 51 and I'm disabled. Okay. I've been collecting for about closer, four years. Closer to the mic. I've been collecting for about four years. Uh, but I'm 51 and I'm disabled. I'm collecting. But I don't know if there's any way that I can increase what I'm collecting or things I should do before retirement age. Okay, are you married? No. Okay. Uh, and you're not divorced? No. Okay, so. In your case, uh, when you hit full retirement age, your disability benefit will automatically convert into a retirement benefit. And at that point, if you have the means, some other means to get by for, for a couple of years or four years, you can suspend your benefit and start it up again at 70. And be, it will start up 32% higher. So there is something you can do. Okay, so uh, just suspend it at 60. Yeah. And that's what we're suggesting for everybody. Now, is that true, I have a question, is that true if his disability benefit is higher than his full retirement benefit? His disability benefit is, in effect, his full retirement benefit. They're the same number. So his disability benefit becomes his full retirement. It's just called the name changes. So you, your disability benefit just starts being called your full retirement benefit. And uh, then you can suspend your full retirement benefit and start up again 70. 
at a 32% higher inflation adjusted or higher level. And that 32% is the 8% a year. 8% times 4. There's no compounding. It's not like 1.08 times 1.08 times 1.08 times 1.08. Just for you math blocks. It's just 4 times 8%. There's no compounding. Okay. Thank you. 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 Yeah, if you can if you can swing it, that would be the way that you go. If you feel you have a pretty high maximum age of life. Not expected, but maximum age of life. Right. Okay, okay great. Please. So, um, Speak right into the mic. Okay. Well, <laughs> so I'm a case of, uh, I was forced retired from the state of Connecticut. Um, uh, I was, uh, I didn't want to retire. I liked my job, but I was only one person. And um, so anyway, physically, I was basically used and tossed out. And so my options were just quit and, and get another job or take our Social Security disability insurance, and that's it. There's nothing else to do. So here I am with only 80% income because it's hazard. It's uh, it's from work was calm. Um, so. So I only get 80% of my uh, income, along with, of course, everything gets taxed as well. Um, I don't know if anything changes once I turn 66 uh, with my Social Security Disability Retirement, because it is connected to my employer. Um, I don't know if at some point I don't, they will take 20% uh, back, or I'm kind of confused as to what what's going to be there for me. Married or divorced? Divorced. Okay, and uh, were you married for, um, for more than ten years? Yes. Okay, and your your ex is uh, alive? Yes. Okay. Well, so if your ex was a much higher earner, it's possible that you could collect uh, what's called you know a, a spousal benefit. Uh, for example, at full retirement age, you could apply for a divorcee spouse benefit, if, if perchance the divorcee spouse benefit exceeds your own uh, retirement benefit, which is your disability check, then you could collect the larger of the two. Then also if your spouse dies, if your ex-spouse dies, you basically collect his check as a divorcee widow. That's 100% that of the full retirement benefit. Right? Yeah. Uh, He's remarried, by the way. It doesn't matter. <laughs> that, doesn't matter. that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Um, that doesn't matter. So, uh, the other thing is that you have the option of suspending your benefit, just like the prior gentleman, uh, suspending your benefit and starting up it again at 70 at a 32% higher level, uh, starting at full retirement age, you can do that. Now, the 20%, uh, I'm not sure whether you're talking about the Social Security, you're getting the Social Security Disability Benefits, right? Right. The, the way it works is my Social Security and my retirement, if I do have a pension, that combination cannot equal 100%. It always has to equal only 80%. Okay, so this is not about Social Security. It's more about the workman's comp. Right. Uh, and uh, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. This uh, employment for the state, that was covered employment, right? You were having Social yes. Security taxes yes. taken out. Okay. So, um, yeah, I don't know about the, the state's workman's comp rules, but I think it's, it's some kind of a tax that they're imposing on the reducing your workman's comp because of your social security disability benefit, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. And of course that's a nasty business. And I think it's just, you know, we have, to me, a war with the bureaucrats. Larry, right. before All you get into your war with the bureaucrats, just yeah. the, how old is your husband? Uh, 62. Your 62. Ex-husband. Ex yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, your ex-husband has to be, you get a spousal benefit, you would have to be 62 or older, and you would have had to be divorced for two or more years, but I think that's probably the case. Yeah, yeah. you were married for 10 years, so, yeah, but he'd have to be a much higher earner than you to for you to collect a spousal benefit. Uh, what would actually be, you get, they would give you a retirement benefit, the way they would describe the larger of the two is you're getting a retirement benefit plus an excess spousal benefit, and it could be that if the larger of the two is really your retirement benefit, the excess spouse benefit would be zero, and you wouldn't get anything. So I think probably the best hope, unfortunately, is in terms of getting higher benefits for you is 
A, if you manage to file and suspend, or B, if your ex were to pass away, uh, not wishing any death on anybody, but if that one. That did happen. Yeah, I'm not either. <laughs> 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 okay, so let's, let's talk to you later. Thank you. Yeah, well, you want to come back and make this guy make your job? <laughs> 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 no, no, I'm not. No, please. And I'm also a retired state employee. And I believe in her case, it's actually a disability pension rather than workers' comp. Right. And it's actually state law rather than social security. So it's a whole different set of jobs. A uh, large part of the audience is the students, and more likely that many of them believe that their parents or grandparents are probably won't be cut. But I'd be also willing to believe that if I would ask for a show of hands, the majority of them would say the system's going to be bankrupt by the time I retire, and it's all meaningless. Very good. And it has nothing to do with what you're talking about. No, no, no. It's, it's the, the, the final chapter of our book is Larry and, uh, and I, it, it, is Larry and I, and our third co-author arguing about this very issue. So I'm uh, happy to have an opportunity to argue once again with Larry. Uh, it, by the way, relates to the, uh, what we've been talking about, because I think that is part of the reason that people even now don't wait until 70. In fact, they know it was the case because there are studies done. People think the system is going to run out of money. And so, damn, I better get my money now. Now, Larry, who is... Probably, well, you're certainly, he's one of the handful of social security experts in the country, and he is also one of the handful of most prominent skulls, chicken littles even, with respect to how broke the social security system is. You see him nodding proudly. Uh, so part of the reason that people think that the system is going broke is because of Larry. Uh, and people like it, saying, oh my God, we're bankrupt, and so forth. But even he is telling you, as we sit here, that certainly for current and proximate, that is, soon, coming soon, uh, beneficiaries, there's no problem. Now, what happened? You're talking about the Gateway students, younger people who are here, uh, and I'll let him go first, and then I'll rebut or respond. So are they going to get money, the, the Gateway students? Or are, they, are, they, are they right to say... They're just screwed. They're never going to get that. <laughs> they're just screwed. They'll uh, <laughs> never get a penny. Here, here's the thing. They may get a penny, uh, but it's going to be taken. You know, it's going to be robbing Peter to take. They're going to take money out of your left pocket uh, that they give you in your right pocket. The the country as a whole is 58 percent underfinanced. We have to raise taxes immediately and permanently federal taxes to pay for all the spending is projected by the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, the Social Security system by itself is, which is part of the bigger picture, but by itself is 33% under finance. So the whole fiscal system is in worse shape than Social Security, but Social Security is in terrible shape, 33% under finance. That's according to Table 6F1 in the trust. It's not throwing out the table. Okay. That's well, a low blow. I'd like you to read this. And, uh, Detroit's pension, by comparison, when Detroit went bankrupt, was about they, those pensions. The two pensions together were about twenty percent under finance. Other other people want to ask questions. I have to have a chance to respond. Okay. So just tell them why you think there isn't going to be enough money. Well, it's it's you know if you do the arithmetic, most of our debts have been kept off the books. We have these obligations to pay benefits to me and Paul. They're not classified as official debts, so they're not off the books. So members of Congress have, have been putting this stuff off the books. What's going to happen to the young? The young people are not going to get Social Security benefits. The entire country is going broke. I, I know yeah. this country is going broke. When I said when I said a chicken little, I wasn't kidding. I hope you the, all. Were, but who exactly is going to fall? And I don't know. Nobody can say for sure. Ah, uh, okay. But we do know it's going to be a crisis. Okay, but, right. So that's his position on this. Yeah. And my position on this, which you can read in chapter 18 of the book, is we will make adjustments. And we will make adjustments, for example, and I'll just give two examples, okay? We will make adjustments to, one, the ceiling after which income of Americans is not taxed for Social Security purposes. Right now, Social Security for the individual, 6.2%, and your employer, 6.2%. So 12.4% of your income, your earned income, not the money you get from investments or something, your earned income is taxed for Social Security. 
But there's a ceiling on the amount, and the ceiling right now is $118,500. It goes up with something approximating inflation. $118,500. That means that everybody who makes more than $118,500, including me and Larry, are not taxed on all that extra income up to if we were to make millions. Let's say this book sold 10 million copies or something like that. Uh, well, it's, the book, book is royalty, so we would not actually, it turns out, have to pay Social Security taxes on it. So. But if we were, you know, we were doing events like this all over the country and paid $50,000 a, a shot or something like that, which is certainly conceivable. I don't think either of us particularly wants to do that. But we'd rather be at a place like, you know, like Gateway. But the, if you, that, that ceiling used to cover 90% of all earned income in America, I don't know, 20 years ago, I don't know the exact number of years. It now covers about 80 some odd percent, the low 80s. Because so much, all the income that's, you know, in America in the last, oh, I don't know how many years, but is all going to the top people at the top, right? We all know that. Then. And so those people are not being taxed for Social Security. So I figure, can't tell you when, can't tell you for sure that this will happen, but I think that that ceiling will get raised. And if you raise that ceiling, according to the Social Security the trustees report, if you raise that ceiling back to covering 90% of American earned income as it used to be, that would cover about a third or a fourth, depending on the time frame you use, of all the current gap that Larry's talking about. So that's one. A second one would be that only, as I said earlier, 85% of Social Security benefits are taxed. Why not go to 100% so that people who are in a higher bracket would be paying for Social Security and you would not? I mean, uh, because you're because it's a progressive tax system, and on and on, and uh, uh, extending the retirement age, for example. Anyway, just so that's my position. Please. Raising the limit would that also increase the benefits those people get? What? What do you mean? Raising the limit that you st if they should pay Social Security from one eighteen, say, to one fifty, would, right. would. would also raise yeah, the, the benefits would, those would. people get, but not nearly one for one. But the people down below would get less. No, no, no. no. Why would they get less? I mean. Because Well, we get less than the people who are getting higher, but they're they're still they're contributing more money to the system if the ceiling is raised than if it isn't. That's all my point. Please go ahead. I just think there'll be adjustments. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Larry, I'd be happy to buy your dinner if you could help me out. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to get fat. You got to worry about this guy. He's going to get fat. I'm still working, but my wife is retired. She was a teacher in Connecticut for 30 years. So she was not allowed to pay into Social Security. So she's not entitled to any of my benefits was, um, as a widow or uh, any of my retired benefits if I were to pass away. Is that, that's what I've been hearing from all her teacher friends who have retired. Is that true? Is there any that's, way around that? That's called the government pension offset, which is another one of Social Security's uh, gotchas. And what happens is that the spouse benefit that she can collect uh, is reduced by two-thirds of her state uncovered pension, and the widow benefit that she could collect if you were to pass away would be reduced by two-thirds of, of that pension. So if two-thirds of that pension exceeds, a, a, for example, your, uh, your um, uh, well, how old are you? I'm 63, and her pension is more than what my Social Security benefit would be. Okay. Even if you wait until 70? Yes. And her pension is indexed for inflation? Is it just for inflation? It's the COVID, if that's what you mean. COVID, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I, unfortunately, the only thing she could really do um, to, well, there's actually nothing she can do. <laughs> no dinner for Larry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Go back to work. If she were to work for 30 years, if she were to work, she has no earnings history with Social Security, right? She did it after she retired. She got uh, 10 years, so she has her 40 quarters in. It's 40 quarters. And as she so she, she is getting like a couple hundred a month from that. But okay, and then has she started taking her or something? Yes. Her state pension? Yes. She has, okay. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, if she were to work another 20 years, she would have, every year you work beyond uh, up through 30 years, and you earn above 
uh, a limit, which is now about $22,000, you have another year of substantial earnings. So if, once you've accumulated, accumulated 30 years of substantial earnings, your own benefit is not reduced by uh, the fact that uh, you have a, this uncovered pension. But uh, the benefits you get on your spouse's record are still affected. You could even be divorced and she would still be uh, hurt by this government pension offset. By the way, if she had earned that pension abroad, if she'd worked in Canada uh, and hadn't paid for street, she would not be subject to the government pension offset. So this is, again, a set of totally unfair provisions that uh, some members of the you know, congressmen or women, uh, staffers in some back rooms and social security bureaucrats, they put this together like a, a jigsaw puzzle that only they understood. They decided this is fair, this is unfair, you know, and then you got, we sorted it out. So I've been working for over 40 years, and that's just And part of what you've been doing is paying, way. you've been paying benefits, you've been paying taxes, 12.4% of your pay, you and your employer. Partly you've been buying life insurance that you'll never get, and spouse benefits you'll never get. This is terribly unfair. The, and I'm a very strong supporter of compulsory savings, compulsory savings, uh, insurance, compulsory disability benefits. I think insurance markets basically don't function for good economic reasons. But I, I can't think of a worse design social security system. So I'm like the strongest supporter of the actual fund, uh, the actual rationale for social security. But I'm the, the, the biggest en enemy of the current design of the system. And I do have a, a proposal, which is called the Purple Social Security Plan, which if you go to the purpleplans.org, you can see how, if I were uh, the president for an afternoon, how I would fix Social Security and uh, also save it for young people. And and so it's now my turn it's to not, say... Not his plan, it's my plan. No, no, not only is it not my plan, I just think that yeah. the idea of simply creating a new system from uh, scratch is just nonsense. <laughs> And I don't think it's a bunch of people in back rooms who did this. It is an infuriatingly complex system, and for those of you who are now doing your taxes, you know that it's exactly the same thing when it comes to filing your income tax, or the criminal code, or anything else there is out there, a contract that you write or have, or the Affordable Care Act. That's just how our country works. I could go on and on about that. At any rate, I just want it stipulated that I don't agree that there's this, you know, easy fix. Not that. You okay. said yours, I said mine. Okay. We've got the next bit. Thank you very much. Please. It would be the moderator. moderator. <laughs> no, no, I'm just... Okay. Well, I, I think that gentleman, myself, and another fellow who was sitting up here at the front row could start a Spouses of Connecticut Teachers. <laughs> <laughs> because that, uh, my initial question was about that same issue. Get closer. That same issue that... Um, and look that way. Yeah, do, do the decisions that my wife and I have to make always have to consider her Connecticut retirement income. And I think you've, you've, you've said clearly that um, there's no incentive for me to pass away first. <laughs> <laughs> Although that may still happen. Um, uh, because she would not probably benefit from that. Um, the spouse uh, spousal benefit that you mentioned, the, yeah. the uh, strategy up front, if I was to take that, is, is her... Here's the thing. If she can... If, uh, if her pension were to start, uh, if she could start her pension late, after, let's say she's now 62, and she could delay taking her pension, her state pension, until maybe 66, and they would compensate her for delaying, just like Social Security compensates, then she could take a, uh, a spouse benefit, or you could die, you know, on time. <laughs> Because this government pension offset doesn't kick in until she starts to, to collect her uncovered pension. But Larry, when you say if she could, there is no current policy in, this, in well, any state. Maybe the state of Connecticut could change the, the Yeah, rates. well, I think that's probably a, a tall order. I don't know, I don't know, maybe. Yeah. Look, this wouldn't cost the state of Connecticut anything. It would help all these teachers, potentially, if they're coming along, get Social Security benefits. Uh, and get out from under the GPO for at least a while, maybe four years. Or well, that's what your support group could do. Do you follow? Yeah. I, I hear you. All right, and, and um, the spousal or the, the survivor benefit, like you mentioned survivor benefits and widower benefits. Are those well, the same thing? Survivor benefits are uh, a code word for 
widow, widower benefits, and also child survivor benefits, and also parent benefits. If you were taking care of, for example, I'm taking care of my 95-year-old mom on the, the main financial caregiver. And so I can you know, deduct her on my income tax as a dependent. Where I pass away, uh, she would be able to collect 85, 82.5% of my, my retirement benefit. And my siblings, uh, I realized at some point that my siblings knew nothing about this. And therefore, I wrote them an email, which they probably forgot about, saying, if I die, you can collect, uh, you apply and file, and mine can collect 82.5% of my full retirement benefit. And, uh, and that's a survivor benefit, too. Okay. Thank you. I have SSI, and I don't work. I'm still here at the LA. As you see, I am disabled, and I would like to have social security uh, disability. I don't know if it is possible. So you have supplemental security income, and uh, you'd like to see if you could collect disability benefits. So I'm not an expert on the eligibility. Let, 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 let's step back. There are two disability programs, both paid through Social Security. One is SSI, Supplemental Security Income. That's not really a disability, it's really just low income. Well, it's also, it's also for people with disabilities. Early on, I know a number of people in that category. Low income due to disability, you know, okay. all a little fuzzy. So but that's SSI, that's what she's talking about. Then there's SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance. And that's, you're saying, can you get SSDI? You, you get SSI now. But you're asking, can you get SSDI? That's the question. Yeah. And there, you would have to uh, talk directly with Social Security. And you have, there are uh, regulations about how, you know, uh, when you became disabled, how were you working uh, within a few years, a certain period of time before you uh, became disabled. Uh, the, uh, so, unfortunately, I'm not an expert on that, on your eligibility. That's uh, one of my areas of learning that I still have to do. I don't, I don't know the rates about qualifying for disability as well as I should. The, the distinction is social, SSDI, Social Security Disability Insurance, is if you worked and contributed to the Social Security system. SSI is often, I don't know if it's exclusively the truth for these people, but people like yourself, but the SSI doesn't have anything to do with how much you, how long you work. So one is people in the Social Security system who work in logged quarters of, of income, Social Security income, and the other one is independent of that. So have you, have you talked to Social Security about whether you're eligible? Well, maybe you should go and Check. Tell them exactly when you became disabled and, and if you were working under the covered employment. Were you working before? So you've never worked? Okay. So then you're probably, it's, then it's an SSI. How old were you when you became disabled? Oh, I am actually 46. So I became uh, disabled when I was 39. Okay, and you hadn't worked in covered employment? No, not yet. I see. Yeah, so then it's another uh, HIV gotcha. It's, uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's any way to get covered by it. Had you been uh, disabled before age 22, you could collect from your parents' record. But that's not the case. Please. Um, anybody will come up? Yeah. Yeah. I actually have oh. submitted a question. So the question is, if you started collecting your Social Security at 62 no. and sus suspended at 66 and worked till you're 70, what is the basis of your Social Security? Like, what is the income that they're basing the Social Security on? Your newer income with the average or? Well, they take the... So if you keep earning money, even if you earn money up to, uh, you know, I could be working at 100, and if I earn enough money, my benefit will go up over and above the increase due to inflation. Uh, 
The reason is that what they do is they take the uh, they take your earnings up through age 60. They blow them up based on start 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 more simply. They, the basis for your benefit is the highest 35 years that you work with Social Security income. Then, <laughs> yeah. So the basis is the but they what they do is they take these are called uh, the highest 35 of uh, years of indexed monthly earnings, and they take those highest 35 years of indexed monthly earnings and they average them. And that becomes the uh, average index monthly earnings. And then they feed that into a progressive benefit formula, which is called the primary insurance amount formula. And that becomes your full retirement benefit. So and it's progressive, just so that yeah, people, it's, we're getting into this level of the index detail. Scale. Wait. Yeah, it's, progressive. it's progressive in that you get a higher percentage of the, your income to a certain point, what's called a bend point. You get a lower percentage after that. We all do. And then a lower percentage still for after the second point. So there, it's like a progressive taxation. Right. So the higher earners get more in absolute terms, but uh, not in proportion to what they contribute. So it's you know it's got this basic fairness feature to it, and because of that, it means that Paul's benefit, even though he's been a much higher earner, his basic retirement benefit is not that much higher than somebody who's earning half as much or even a third as much as he's earned. Uh, in his, but anyway, in this, uh, the earnings up to age 60 are blown up, this, they're indexed up, and then after that... Wait, 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 wait. And what he means by that is, say, the earnings was from 35 years ago, and it was a low nominal amount because there wasn't much inflation, right? So there, there's been a lot of inflation since, but the dollar was worth more. So what they do is they take that year's worth of earnings, 35 years ago, and they account for the inflation since. It's not, just, it's not actually the inflation, it's the wage growth in the economy. Yeah, well, the average yeah, wage growth. Yes, that's but a big difference, Paul. One is, uh, I, I'll, let me do the explanation, and then you can do the. <laughs> it's, the wage growth is an attempt. Is it, why we had so much fun writing that book. Yes, you can, you, you can see the frustration even as you watch it. <laughs> it is, in essence, trying to adjust for the fact that the dollar was worth more back then, and, but it's going to be a lower number. And so you want the number to equalize the numbers today, and I think the easiest way to think about that is in terms of inflation, which is what they're trying to do. In the case of they use wage so, as an index. So when he says index, he means they're translating those dollars into today's dollars, okay? And, th and they're doing that for each of the years in the past, but only up to age 60, and they're doing it based on wage growth, not on inflation. And wage growth has been higher than inflation, so that matters significantly. And then after age 60, they just take your nominal earnings. So if we have very high inflation, for example, and people are earning, you know, suppose all, all prices double and all wages double tomorrow, then your average would be, you know, you're over 60, then you would most likely, uh, uh, your current earnings would exceed uh, the highest of the uh, higher 35, if you had 35 years of covered earnings, even if they've been indexed, uh, and your average index monthly earnings would be higher, and therefore your, the thing going into this basic formula would be higher, and your benefit would go up. So it's only, it only has to be higher than the lowest of the 35 years. Yeah, right. Everybody right. follow? So, you, so if you have a year now where suddenly there's inflation, but they aren't adjusting the prior years anymore, and now you've got a new, much higher year just because there's inflation, why then that year knocks out one of your lower years, your average goes up, and your benefit goes up. That's the, that's the basis of it. So that's a reason to continue to work. That's a incentive to work. On the other hand, if you're, work, if you're making much less money between age 66 and 70, right, then it might be that that amount would not displace one of the higher, the 35 years on which the average is. Is it 35 consecutive years? No, no, no. All right, I think we're, I think we, oh, you, one, one more. Okay, cool. oh, well, oh, all of you. Oh, my. All right, well, then let's, we'll try to make our answer put so no, don't say anything that I have to contradict. <laughs> oh, I think I have a quick question. Okay. Um, I am divorced, married more than 10 years. Um, how do I, I have no idea what my ex 
have made in the last you, you can, you Will know, Social Security give me an idea, like if I'm trying to figure this out? As you get close to, uh, how old are you now? I'm 65. Okay, if you go to, into their office uh, and show that you were married and then divorced, they'll uh, tell you what your ex's full retirement benefit uh, is. Okay. They won't tell you the earnings history. That has to be private property, not your property, private information. I think that also is... Uh, just, to, but just answer. The answer is they will tell you something. It's not everything you... And because you're close to uh, you know, retirement age or at retirement age, um, they will have to tell you. Okay. But if you were 45, they might not even have to tell you anything. So, how do you plan for retirement if you can't figure out about your divorce? You better have it. The answer to her question is yes. <laughs> I have one other really quick Good. question. Is, no, I if thought. I suspend, you know, if I take sp spousal and suspend at 66, yeah. and all of a sudden come along at 68 and can't do it and need to take my own, can I do that? Can It'll I wipe suspend out. at 68 instead of 70? You, yes, you can. Okay. Suspend, you could, well, you don't want to suspend because this is very, very important. All you want to do is file for your divorce your spouse benefit. Oh, okay. If you were to file, if you were to file and suspend, you will fall into uh, this world called excess benefit health, which is you will be treated as if you're taking your retirement benefit, even if you're not, even if you suspended it. They'll compare it with your spouse benefit. They'll give you the larger of the two. They'll take that ex. They'll take the difference between the two and give it to you, which could be zero. And tell her what she should be doing. Yeah. Don't be suspended. Yeah, she does file her diversity spouse benefit. And then, uh, if you need to take the retirement benefit, which would be higher, uh, you can do it any time between 66 and 70. And what does she have to bring to the office? She has to bring proof of marriage and proof of divorce. Yeah, okay. Uh, that's Thanks. Okay, great. Please, next. Well, my question is very similar. Um, if, uh, my question is though, if my husband has not put in the benefit yet, my ex-husband. Doesn't affect you as long as, it, as, it, as he's 62 or over. Okay. And you've been divorced for two or more years. And what about his present wife? Does she, I mean, how she do I... On, uh, she can collect on his record. He could be married four, four or five times to for 10 or more years. All five wives, exes to collect. We have a chapter uh, about William T. Gigolo. In the book, it's very funny. About this guy goes through life just collecting on the exes. So you can. So it has nothing to do with the fact that he's remarried. If you were remarried, that would affect your. You wouldn't be able to get a spouse benefit. But if you remarry after sixty, you could get a, a divorcee widow benefit. And by the way, if you were to remarry at let's say fifty, I you realize that you had this ex who earned a lot of money, and he passed away or might pass away, what you could do is at 59, get divorced, remarry the same person at 60. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's one you all want to write down. And if I just say, when you suspend a spousal, does that affect the wife's benefits? Is that deducted from their benefits? Because you're now collecting part of theirs? No, if you, if you suspend, you can't suspend a spouse benefit, you can only suspend your own retirement benefit. That's the only thing you can suspend. Okay, thank okay. you. Great. Next. Yeah, just hand, pass the baton. That's a good way to do it. Yeah, that's... My wife is, uh, she started collecting at 66. She has three more months before she hits 70. Can we pay them back? You know, unfortunately, you only have a year to uh, do what's called a withdrawal of your filing for your retirement benefit. So it's beyond a year. It used to be you could do it at any time and pay it back. And then, frankly, I started writing about this. Other people started writing about it. And so Street, out of the blue, changed the law. And they've also done some things out of the blue that hurt disabled people that I've written about on Paul's website. So, uh, yeah. All right, so what's this spousal benefit? She'd not be crazy, right? I'm five years younger. Uh, next year I'll be 66. Can I go on that spousal benefit? Just, just file, just for a spousal benefit. Yeah. Right. Just for a spousal benefit. Just for that. You're not trying to file. Suspend. 
Well, you'd have to suspend. No, 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 I go in and say, I want a spousal benefit. They may say to you what they said to me, which is I never heard of such a thing. And you say to them, don't worry, it's, it's true. true. Go check with the supervisor. <laughs> and then, <laughs> yeah, give them a copy of the book. Okay. This, this will be more well known now as it's so Okay, so just to be clear, you should never file for your own benefits if you can file for spousal benefits first. Yeah. The day you file for your retirement benefit, you plunge into excess benefit health. You can even just, you can scrub your own widow benefits too, because once you file uh, for your retirement benefit and you're collecting it, and you only have a year not to do that mistake, and then you have to pay everything back that they gave you, uh, uh, the minute you do that, they're going to give you the larger of the two benefits. So your ability to take one benefit by itself and let the other benefit grow goes away. So you got to be very, very careful about filing for your retirement benefit. And we caution people a lot in the book, and the software helps people figure out what exactly to do and what not to do. Because Social Security has mind, mind traps. They're, I know it's, I well, I, you, you've made, you've made I, that I, point. Drive on the I think everybody's convinced that they're a mind trap. Yeah. One more thing. What's the difference between filing, or is there a difference um, between the percent you get of the spousal benefit if you file at 62 versus 66? Uh, if you take a spousal benefit, at 62 would be about 25 percent lower than at, six, at full retirement age, and of course, for somebody your age, they're raising the full retirement age to 67, so it'll be more like 30 percent lower. Um, so this is, you know, we talked about robbing Peter, to, you know, taking money out of the left pocket. To put, what they're doing already in the law is uh, depriving younger people of the same benefits that we older people are collecting. They're, not in debt. they're also not indexing the threshold beyond which Social Security benefits are taxed under the federal income tax. This is a care of David Stockman from the uh, Reagan administration. Okay. I have another submitted question. Yes. So the submitted question is if you uh, take your retirement at 62 and then suspend at 66 or your full retirement age, because for, for me it's 67, um, then when you want to reactivate it, can you do it at... 69, for instance, if you wanted to, and get the 16% more, or do you have to wait till you're 70? No, so you can reactivate, if you suspend, you can uh, start up any time between full retirement age and 70. And they'll give, it, give, they'll give you what's called the delayed retirement credits on a monthly basis. How many months have you uh, suspended your benefit for? They'll calculate the delay. So if it's I may have asked the wrong question. Oh, that's okay. You answered the right question. <laughs> Thank you. It's, but it's, it's, you have to do it at 68 to get the 16%. Right. right. 8% right. here. You said right. And for me, it'd be 69 because I'm 67 for full retirement age. Yes. Right, right but you won't get 8. Oh, I see. 66. Right. Yeah. You're right. I'm wrong. Is, is 10 years 120 months? Uh, yeah, it's 10 years in a day, 120 so, months in so a like day. If you were married for like 9 years and 11 months, SOL, right? That's right, and that's why he says you could get divorced, you could get divorced, and then come back, and then marry again the next year, but that's right. You could go back to that spouse if you married that spouse. <laughs> Not if they're dead. <laughs> <laughs>
promised these benefits in order to get reelected. And uh, they called these benefits transfer payments rather than uh, interest and principal payments on government debt. They put them off the books. They engaged in accounting that would make Enron blush or Bernie Madoff blush. And now we have this monstrosity of, of unfunded entitlement obligations. State of Connecticut has these too, right? I mean, you're gonna, the more you do this, the more I'm going to have to rebut, and then we'll just. Okay. So, Egan, the, 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 the part of the answer that's correct is the politicians are giving us you know, what we want, and we want higher benefits, and we don't want to pay for them. And that's true of every program you can think of. And Social Security is no different. And Social Security looks like you can put it off forever, and therefore it's not going to come a proper, and so you kick the can down the road. I agree with you. Oh. Okay. Oh. Okay, so anyway, I'm sorry. Is there any, no, what do you think about if you work past your full retirement age, which is 66, and you can you can collect your Social Security, your full Social Security, with no limits to how much you make, right. what do you think about that? As a, a, as a policy flaw? As opposed to waiting to collect your money until you're 70. I would wait till 70. I really would wait till 70 because you're getting a 32% higher check every month from 70 to 100. And you look like you can make it to 150. <laughs> <laughs> I want to spend my money now, because I'm not sure. No, but, no, no. Well, but remember that there are, our, our biggest, our real point here is, I mean, it's probably the most important thing we're trying to get across in the book, is this notion of thinking of your future self and being concerned about what it would be like and how, how dependent you and how unhappy you would be here's if you didn't problem. have X money. Here's, here's a better answer. I wouldn't be me. unhappy, first of all. I'd be, I'm very happy now. I'd live off of these dreams for the next 50 years. But if I can get my full paycheck, say, for example, I'm making $100,000 a year, I'm getting my full Social Security. Why would I wait to 70? Because it's more money. Yeah, but you don't have as good a health. You don't, I mean, you don't get to enjoy it as well. But here, here's a, here's what, here's a different way to think about it, which is. That's how I used to think, and he turned me around. So. Okay. If you have, another way to think about this is that uh, you may have some savings, 401k money, for example. So you can have a higher living standard now if you tap into that between 66 and 70. And also a higher living standard later because you're taking advantage of this great return that Social Security offers from, from waiting. So it's not a lose win or a win lose, it's a win win. It's a higher living standard now and a higher living standard later. Assuming you have enough saved to do these things that you want to be doing now. That's all. But you seem to be stuck on something, and this is this is an issue. Stuck on money. I, yeah. I retire. I retire from the city. Right. We did not pay into the social security system. Uh, but I had worked for 29 years outside of the city. Um, okay, so I think that's like one year short where they won't offset it. Yes, you have, so uh, you, you're going to have very little uh, reduction in your benefit because you have 29 years of substantial earnings. But I got a reduction and my salary was reduced when I retired, and my social security was reduced. Okay, thank you very much. I have a good question. No, and it wasn't you. It's a little friend you had that I can't Oh, no, no, no. I have what, what were you, what, do you want to come up here? And I was there a mouse here? Yes. I see. I know, I didn't think that was me. I thought, <laughs> and I thought man, have I really? I, I can alienate an audience, but this is ridiculous. <laughs> I also have another submitted question. If you are widowed, divorced, widowed, at 62 you want to collect uh, survivor and widow benefits, but then can you turn over, uh, how did this go, I forgot what the question was, um, then can you wait until you're 70 and collect your own because it will be reduced at 62, or even wait till you're 66, collect your own that's not reduced? Yeah, you can, if you're, let's say, not working, not being hit by the earnings test, and you can collect a widow benefit that's lower than your uh, 
we don't retire that, but we set lower that would be at 70. And we need to do a start at 60, not 62, you can start a little earlier at 60. And if you're disabled, by the way, you can start at 50, start collecting your widow's benefit, and then take your uh, retirement benefit at 70. So that's one strategy for people that are widowed. Another strategy is to take your retirement benefit early and widow benefit later. Uh, on the way to the full retirement age, in some cases it's better to take it even before full retirement age. So uh, the basic idea is not to take two benefits at the same time unless you have to. The basic idea is to take one benefit early and let the other one grow and then take it back. Because you're never going to be taking two benefits. They're just going to give you one. So you can't take two. So you got to be careful that you don't seem to be applying. Yeah. Uh, at age 65, uh, everyone is uh, uh, regulated to apply to Medicare. And you go to the Social Security office to do so. Does that mean you already filed without collecting? Or are you looking at no. Medicare is totally separate from Social Security. When you walk in the door, they may try and induce you to file for social, social Security. I think they somehow get compensated based on how many people they sign up. And you have any basis for saying that? <laughs> uh, no, it's a hunch. But uh, yeah, it's a guy's question. I think it's a well hunch, but uh, it's because they're so adamant about pushing people. But now you can just file for your Medicare and tell them, no, I don't want to file for Social Security whatsoever. And there's two separate programs, and one filing does not invoke the other file. So at 66, then, one should go back to the Social Security office and apply for, for the Social Security without taking the benefit until 70. Not necessarily, because uh, if you file for your, it very much depends on your, if of course you're never married, okay? And you want to wait until 70 to collect your retirement benefit, then there would be a good reason to file and suspend that for retirement age, and then just wait till 70, because when you do that, you're able to, at any point between full retirement age and 70, go back to Social Security and say, look, I'd like to get collected a lump sum check and a single check for all those suspended benefits. And I know my benefit, retirement benefit will be reset downward, but at least it gives me an option if I know, let's say I learned that I'm going to have some incurable disease and my life, uh, my max major life is dramatically strong, um, that I can go get, then go and get my suspended benefits. So if you're if you're a situation of never married or effectively never married because you were married but divorced before 10 years of marriage, that's something you should do. And we talk about that in the book. But if you, uh, let's say you are married, and now you've got a younger wife, and you're 66, and you're saying, should I file and suspend and wait till 70? Because it gives me this option of collecting all those suspended benefits in a lump sum. But then, if you suppose your spouse, your wife, was a higher earner, and God forbid she were to pass away, you'll no, no longer be able to get a widow benefit by itself for four years, between 66 and 70, because you will have filed. You will have dropped into excess benefit health. And isn't this cool? I mean, isn't this just the greatest retirement system? So, uh, so let me tell you about... No, 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 no. You're not telling him about that. The person is asking you a question. And you're here to so you're, you're advising to actually file at 70. I'm saying it depends. Well, if you are single, never married, I would advise you to file and suspend at full retirement age and start out again at, and start your benefit at 70. Unless you, at some point between 66 and 70, realize that you need to have a lot of money and a lot of sum, then you can go get all your suspended benefits. But if you're married, or divorced, you know, having been married for 10 more years, I'd be very careful about filing because your spouse uh, might pass away. Uh, also, you'd be collecting spouse benefit on your spouse's record, unless the spouse is collecting on your record. So it uh, it depends uh, on your situation. I, I when when I did what I did, I did not file and suspend. Right? You just filed. I just I mean, filed. You just filed for a spouse benefit. Just, I just took the spouse of Yeah. So there are these nuances. I mean, the, Lorraine just handed me the book. This is the book, for those of you who haven't seen it. Uh, and there are these, these variety of different things you have to be thinking about 
One of them, which has just come up after an hour and a half of discussion, is this idea of the lump sum, which I literally we haven't discussed until this very moment. So it's it's very complex, but there are, so there are arguments for filing and suspending, even if it's only yourself, and arguments against doing it, and it depends, as we say in the book, in this system, everything married? depends. Uh, I'm not married. Are you divorced? I'm divorced. How long were you married for? I was married for uh, 21 years and divorced for 21. Okay, so you both, you and your ex can collect divorcee spouse benefits, so probably the best thing for you to do is that for retirement age. You're now 65? I'm 65. Okay, next year when you're 66, go in and, add, and file what's called a restricted application just for your divorcee spouse benefit, and take that till 70, and then at 70 take the retirement benefit. That's the, my ex spouse uh, did not work during the years that I uh, we were married. Oh, okay. But then you can't really collect anything on our work record. Do you collect this money? Well, no, honey, had she worked before or after? Uh, she worked uh, as a secretary for a few years. But, uh, in the marriage, uh, marriage. It doesn't What's have that? to do with in the marriage. She could be working today. You could still collect on her. If she's working today. Yeah, yeah. All we need is 10 years of covered earnings. So it's 40 quarters. Okay. So and you may think that there's no benefit there, but this, the benefit form is so progressive that she might have been earning just, you know, as a secretary, but you'd still get a significant payment. Maybe it's five hundred dollars a month. Maybe it's three hundred. It's not going to be nothing if she has forty quarters of cut. So we each can collect on the other. Yeah. At the same time. So there's an advantage to getting divorced. <laughs> and then, now, and so, and so, let, yeah. let me ask you. But we we married in seventy. Get remarried in 70, but it's in. Get remarried in 70. As far as I know, it's perfectly legal. And we've heard from a number of people that there's an advantage to getting divorced in this. <laughs> as a, as a follow-up, if you don't mind, uh, if one is 65 and were to marry, let's say, uh, now or a year from now, can the new spouse collect? After uh, nine months, the new spouse can collect a uh, widow's benefit. If you were to get married... Uh, but I'm, that's oh, you would not be a widow. So if you were to get married and then die, then you get to nine months. Um, and there are some exceptions where you can die even before nine months. And then if you stay married for a year, uh, well, if you're, let's say you're continuing to be married, it only takes a year for your wife to qualify, your new wife to qualify for spouse benefits. So your old wife, your ex-wife, and your new wife could both qualify uh, and get spouse benefits on your record. After one year of marriage with a new spouse. Yes. <laughs> it's a hell of a pickup line. That's right, I believe it. One more question. Okay, great. So if someone's on disability uh, and then let's say they're they can get a spousal benefit. I mean, I don't know, there's probably lots of, but should they file for that? Or because you were saying that it turns over to your regular Social Security benefit. At yeah. Time. So in our book, we have a big mistake. Um, and it's a mistake because Social Security changed the rules basically on Christmas Eve with respect to how they treat disabled people. So before uh, December 23rd, 2014, it appeared, based on the black and white in the, law, in the regulations, that a disabled person could reach full retirement age, withdraw their benefit, not suspend it, but withdraw it, and then just take a spousal benefit and start their own retirement benefit at 70. Okay? But on December 23rd, some Social Security person, bureaucrat, goes in there and rewrites the regulation. Nobody ever is you know, getting ready for Christmas. Nobody notices this except, notices this except uh, Jerry Lutz, who helps us uh, make sure our my answers are correct. Anyway, he tells me, I write this column about Social Security's Christmas Eve present for the disabled, which is taking for millions of disabled people this benefit away from them. The opportunity to get what, uh, what married people can get, and also what divorced people can get, which is a full spouse benefit between full retirement age and 70, without, uh, you know, and then take their retirement benefit. So, unfortunately, they've changed the rules and we'll have to, in our next edition, fix that. Look, but I think it's horribly discriminatory to resist disabled. And that's why I wrote it in the column that's in, uh, in Paul's uh, 
part of the website. Now, are you afraid, or should we be afraid that when the you know book comes out and more and more people learn these little nuances of the system, that things can get changed just like that? I, well, the Clinton, uh, the Obama administration uh, has actually in their budget a proposal that's very vague about changing what are called aggressive uh, collection strategies and claiming strategies. Now, so far, that's gone nowhere. It's been in their budget. The Republicans said their budget's dead on arrival. I don't see the Republicans cutting, doing anything that sounds like a social security benefit cut before the election. Um, and if the bureaucrats had the ability to do this, they probably would have done it already. So I think, uh, and so many people have done this now that it would cause uh, a big, a big fight. Yeah, and, and, and they didn't do it. The Obama administration did not put it in its budget because of our book. Right. I mean, this, you know, there are people who have been doing this for a long time. We wrote the book because we want everybody to know what the strategies are. Ryan and I disagree about what I'm about to say, also. But the one, the way I like to frame this, maybe just make myself feel better, is that instead of gaming the system. What we're doing here is, and I said this in the very beginning, we're enabling people to wait until 70, which we think is an unmitigated good. It's just unequivocally a good thing for people to have that insurance against their old age. You and I may differ on this one as well. But the, what, if that were the case, and as I said in the beginning, less than 2% of people wait until 70, if lots more people began to wait until 70, then, Social Security would be shelling out less money for quite a while. Now, eventually, no, because there are higher benefits, everybody would be taking it. But if every, right now, the average age at which people take Social Security is about 63. Almost half of all people take at age 62, 40 some odd percent. Men and women, 42, 46, something like that percent. So if you moved everybody from 63 to 70, seven years in which people are not taking benefits in order to insure themselves against that their, their savings. And that would have, at least for a while, arguably a beneficial effect. Larry thinks that would then get the politicians off the hook with regard to doing anything about it, which is a reasonable response. Yeah, a lot of people aren't taking Social Security. You know, I, I think you're wrong here. Hold on. I work no, this is Social Security. What I'm trying to say is I work, I'll, I'll tell you where I work. This is courses. I've I got a good yeah. pension, like that. good 401 and everything like that. A lot of guys out are leaving Sikorsky's at, uh, at six. Well, a lot of them are still working there. They're waiting for Medicare to kick in. You know what I'm saying? And that's, you know. Uh, I'm, just tell, I'm just telling you what the numbers are. The numbers are 40 some odd percent. People that go out at 62 are people that have pensions and good 401s, I think. I, think I, 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 don't, I don't know why. All I'm saying is it's 40 some odd percent. And if those people, if we get those people to wait until 70, then I'm saying, well, how are you going to live on just Social Security alone? It's well, you, because you said those people have pay, other people good pensions. But, but look, I, I'm not arguing that, you know, I understand that people can't afford to. We're completely conscious of that. I'm only talking about the actual financial implications if we got the more people to win. A lot of people are taking it at 62. Because yeah. Well, I'm 62 right now. Today is my eighth year anniversary. I have not had a job. And a lot of people, right. my mom was the same way. She had to take hers at 62 because she had a low paying job and she needed it to live on. I am intending to wait till 70. And I'm going to school here right now because I have to to find a job because I already have one degree, but it's not good enough in the real world. And I did work under the state too. And at 62, they took part of my pension away. They took $263 away from my pension because that's the way it's written at the state that when you're 62 and you're eligible for Social Security, they took my money back. That was so the same situation. I'm really angry. angry. Well, not you, angry. but somebody else. And I'm just saying that. I, I a lot of people in my age bracket, I'm a baby boomer, and they did, they're taking the 62 because they can't get jobs. We would like to wait to 66 or 7. Well, some people can't, but I am not making them have to take it at 62. I'm going to wait. God bless you and good luck because, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm outraged too by all, these, all this complexity. Uh, you know, let me just say one quick thing before I interrupt, please. Uh, but I'll have to rebut.
great democracy uh, for New Zealand, they have one rule, not 2,728 plus hundreds of thousands of others, 2,728 rules. They have one rule, which is you hit 65, you get a check. It's the same check for everybody. I'm not saying that should be our system, but I'm saying we can do better. We don't have to have uh, the bureaucrats rule our lives. And then hit us with things that you're not expecting, like the integrated pension system, which is what you're putting into the social security integrated system. Which, uh, yeah, and you're going along, you had no idea about that integration provision. All of a sudden, you're that I, I just would like to read, uh, New Zealand is home to 3 million people and 60 million sheep. So I'm not sure if New Zealand is exactly the system of life. I think they're up to 4.4 million, but I think the sheep are probably up too. Uh, Did you guys say that you don't keep score when you play tennis? We do not. You can, that's a darn good thing. <laughs> you can see why not. No, no, it's not the, that's not the reason, actually. No, no, it's just, that's, well, you'll see. If you read the book, you'll see this kind of fireworks going on uh, in there, too. It, it's an unusual last chapter of a book where the, the two authors disagree with each other. By <laughs> but we're driving home together. We're, we're Don't you worry about it, then. <laughs> well, anyway, thank you all for coming. Oh, one more question here. One other thing. Uh, yeah, let's make this last question. And for there, There's one thing, I think. If you give Lorraine your emails, I know they're... You know, most people have left now. But if you give Lorraine your emails, we will, I will, send you what I call, I have something that I've written up called an unchain letter. So it's like a chain letter in the sense that the idea is for you to send it to people you know who will be, I promise you, some of them extremely grateful. And it, it mentions some of these strategies. It references Larry's column and where you can find it. It links to it. And of course, it mentions the book, but so you have you don't have to buy the book, or your friends don't have to buy the book. But it is a way of alerting people, and so you send it out to them; they send it out to other people. And again, it's all in the interest, really, of trying to be as useful as we can. So if you give her your email, we'll we will uh, send you. You said that um, the rate of Social Security they take out in checks is thirteen percent. Is that just in Connecticut, or is that? 13%? Yeah, 13%, that's what they take out. Oh, 12.4, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so, is that like state or? That's like any social state? security, any federal. Yeah, federal. Yeah. This is all a federal program. So as long as it's social security earnings, they might, if you were working for the state or municipality, you might be paying into a pension system which is outside social security. That's what a number of people here have been talking about. People are Connecticut teachers, or married to Connecticut teachers. But yes, if you have regular income that's paying into the Social Security system, they take 6.2% out of your contribution, and they take 6.2% out of your employer. So that adds up to 12.4%. They, they, make, they make it look like you're only paying 6.2%, but the employer's not doing any favors. He's not paying your taxes for you out of the goodness of his heart. And so in effect, you're paying 12.4%. So even right there, we have uh, this obfuscation of uh, receipt, really, at the federal level, where the Congress has set things up to make it look like we're paying half the federal, the uh, FICA taxes. That stop, they stop with the ranking. The, 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 anyway, <laughs> that's the, that's what's, you're, you're getting that much taken out. And if you assume that the, and what he's saying is if you assume the employer would have paid you the money, instead of paying for Social Security, well then, they're taking it out of your eye, but you yeah, have people shaking their heads thinking that might not be entirely accurate. That is, they might not just have paid you at all. And then they're just forced to pay the 6.2% that they would not otherwise pay at all. Anyway, that's, that's enough. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming.